Peter Codron is a prolific hard science fiction author who isn't afraid to break with conventional wisdom when it comes to telling a good story. The reviews show he knows how to write a crowd pleaser. After all, for Peter, it's about the fun and challenge of telling plausible yet entertaining stories that are easy to read. He's also not afraid to write and publish more experimental stories, even if that means not writing a bestseller every time. And then there's his unconventional writing process. To learn more, be sure to listen to today's episode of the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Freckleton. Have you ever noticed how fear stops us from creating and sharing our best work? Join the Fearless Storyteller as we explore the heart and soul of writing stories, songs, and scripts that sell with the people who write them. Each guest has their own unique hero's journey and insights into the intersections between limiting beliefs and success. If you're enjoying this podcast, be sure to leave a review on your favorite podcatcher of choice. Also, be sure to check out the show notes for a link to the Patreon offerings. I've got some good ones for you. Thanks so much for being a listener and supporter of the show. Enjoy today's interview. Peter Codron, welcome to the Fearless Storyteller podcast. And did I say your name correctly? <laughs> Very close, Ethan. Peter Codron. Great. Yeah. Great. And for people who don't know who you are, Peter, um, what would you like to share about yourself? Yeah, well, I'm a uh, hard science fiction writer. Uh, the term hard science fiction, I think, is a genre that's accepted in the industry, but uh, it's a term I don't actually like because I think people automatically think that it's going to be difficult to read or it's going to be overly technical and um, boring. Uh, but I specialize in plausible science fiction. Uh, I was born and raised in Auckland, New Zealand, um, now living in Brisbane, Australia. Um, uh, I've lived around the world. I actually spent a couple of years in the US as well as the UK and Scotland. And I've got uh, around 24 novels to my name um, and 14 in a series called First Contact, mm. which is it's a rather unusual um, series because most series follow characters and you have to start at book one and you've got to work your way through all the books. Because the subject is first contact, mm. every, every book is first. <laughs> mm. you, know, you can jump in on any book you want, anything that interests you, because each one is looking at the initial point at which humanity comes in contact with an extraterrestrial species. So rather than being uh, character driven, it's thematic, meaning mm. it follows the theme. So it's more like uh, like sort of the Twilight Zone or Black Mirror, where right. you can look at an episode list and you might you know watch episode five, then episode three, then episode seven, and jumping around, you know, there's no dis uh, disconnect at all there. You're able to uh, follow things quite closely. Yeah, so 14 novels into that and 24 novels in. So, like, how did you come to writing? I've always enjoyed you know, reading fiction, and I, I think it's something that enriches our lives. And I was reading um, an author that I thoroughly enjoyed, Matthew Riley, who's an Australian action adventure writer. And he's got a novel. Um, called Temple, and it's a great story. But to, in the final act, it started going off the rails a bit, and I found mm. myself getting frustrated and going, you know, he should have gone here, he shouldn't have done this, he should have done that. And that's why I realized, well, I don't know if I think I can do better, maybe I should have a couple. And so I started writing. Of course, my first couple of novels never left the drawer. Um, but I started realizing that it's a great outlet for creativity. It's a great opportunity to um, uh, exercise that part of the mind where you're wanting to express an idea and explore ideas. And 
the idea that I find most captivating is first contact. So that, I sort of naturally went down that path. But um, when it comes to writing, there's sort of two approaches. There's plotting and pantsing, you know, where someone flies by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think a lot of writers go for plotting and, you know, pantsing is seen as a bit of a dirty word. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but in reality, I think there's something to be said for um, flying by the seat of your pants because you don't get locked into a plot and pushed along by artificial points or things that are just constructs of the plot and need to be there for the plot to work and so don't actually really make logical sense. And that was what I'd found with this particular book by Matthew Riley. You know, at, um, at one point he has a a guy, you know, break into a military installation and then the guy puts on the guard's uniform and the guard's got a big heavy backpack. Mm. And you don't hear, you don't hear anything more about that. And then the final part of the movie, or part of the book, sorry, it, it read like a movie, <laughs> uh, the character falls out of a plane and then suddenly realizes that this thing on his back is a prototype jetpack and he flies away and saves the day. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I found myself screaming in frustration. No, you know. <laughs> they call it the Deus Ex Machina, like kind of saved by an act of God, or just... yes, exactly, exactly. And, and I've, so I've I... certainly done that in a story or two, by the way. It... It, yeah, and, and that's something I, I really try hard to avoid. I'll, I'll try to paint my characters into a corner. Yeah, and then, you know, not have any preconceived ideas on how I'm going to get them out of it. Right. Well, and so I think that's one of the reasons why pantsing often has, you know, is a dirty word or has that connotation is that I think it's perceived that pantsers write themselves into the corner and then need that unrealistic or, you know, just conveniently placed, like, hook to bring them out of it, right? Like, Stephen King said in on writing, I think, you know, <laughs> when in doubt, right, just like blow the town up or kill everybody, right? <laughs> yeah, and there certainly are MacGuffins. Um, so how do you, I'm, so how are you, so how are you, like, so it sounds like you're a committed pantser is what I'm getting, like you're making a confession that you're, a, you write hard science and you're a committed pantser and that, you know, for people on the outside looking in might sound really intimidating if you're writing hard science fiction and have to get things right. Yes, it, but that's where the, I think the real reward is, is you can uh, paint someone into a corner and you can come out with a genuine solution that's actually going to be real world. I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, one of the um, classic examples in literature is Chekhov's gun, you know, which came from a play mm -hmm. that Chekhov wrote in the early 1900s. And there was a gun hanging over the uh, mantelpiece in the play. And, you know, in the final act, the gun gets used. And then that became something where um, you shouldn't have superfluous plot points. You know, if something's in your story, it should eventually be used. Right. And and, and that's, that's, a, that's a part of plotting. You know, people lay out things so that it's going to, end up in a certain way. The problem is the original point of Chekhov's gun was to avoid superfluous plot points. In reality, what happens now is they end up being spoilers. We've learned to spot Chekhov's gun. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, watch, if I watch an episode of uh, Elementary, which mm -hmm. I love, by the way. Um, you're looking, pick, you're looking for the Chekhov's gun. Exactly. I can pick the killer by about the 20 minute mark. Yeah, because I know they have to place those things to get to an end result. If you've seen the movie Knives Out, um, there's a there's a character in the movie that's an old lady that can't talk, and a lot of um, uh, a, a, a real point is made of the fact that she can't speak, um, mm. and she sees someone climbing, you know, outside the house. And as soon as I saw that at about the one third point in the story, I was like, well, there's Chekhov's gun. That is going to be critical at unraveling this thing at the end. And sure enough, it was. Mm -hmm. So I think even though Pantsying is has a, a bad name, 
it avoids those things mm -hmm. because you're not you're not putting these points in early to try to contrive a particular ending. An example from uh, well, I, I wrote a zombie series and. Um, in there, I actually put in an anti Chekhov's gun, and I did it quite deliberately. So okay. I had the character, um, they had a gun, they were out of ammunition, they climb up on top of a strip mall, there's zombies all on the street, and they find a gun. Here's my Chekhov's gun. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> to make it realistic, I had the gun was, you know, the barrels all mangled and bent, and the ammunition is not the same ammunition as well the main character is carrying, so it's useless. Mm. And then I said, okay, well now, now I've destroyed Chekhov's gun, how am I actually gonna get this person out of here? Mm. And I took a day or two to really think about what would I do if I was on that strip mall roof, you know, series of interconnected shops and there's zombies all around. And it got me to, to, to think beyond plot points and to think beyond, you know, MacGuffins and Deuce Ex Machina and actually look for a legitimate way to escape that scenario. And, and the, the solution I came up with was, okay, you know, throw some clothing down at one end, the smell and the noise is going to attract them, you know, bricks and clothing and stuff like this. That gets them all go to one end of the, the strip mall. You can head to the other end and you know, get down and there's gonna be relatively few zombies. But it still left me with the fact that my character no longer had a gun. Mm. And so then I started thinking, well, what can they actually use around them? And I realized that it was actually a brilliant solution staring me in the face the whole time. And it's something that is found everywhere around the world in every building. And it's something the character doesn't even need to carry with them. So they don't need unlimited ammo, they can just use this device, move on, they're going to find another one. Mm. And it was fire extinguishers. Mm -hmm. So a fire extinguisher, you know, CO2 blows, a, or, or even powder, blows a big cloud, confuses things, shuts down the sense of smell. Um, you know, you can use it up, you can use it as a battering ram if you need to, it runs out, you're going to find another one further down the mall. You know, you're going to find another one in the next large building that you go into. So by avoiding the Chekhov's gun and by avoiding the rigid plot point that, you know, uh, X must happen, then Y, and then Z, I was able to say, well, actually, if we're in that scenario, what opportunities are actually going to present themselves? What things are naturally going to come to the forefront? So I don't have to have a contrived solution. I can have something that's intelligent and spontaneous, and it's going to make sense. Mm. So it's a lot of fun, and that's the challenge I love. I love painting characters into a corner and figuring out, okay, how could they really get out of this? Not with any, you know, mysterious magical help from an author. Yeah, and w so was that always a consideration from you going back to the first books you wrote? Or is that something you kind of grew into as you were studying craft? Um, I, I, it definitely grew over time, but it, it's what, it was the frustration that sort of got me to think about writing it because I would see all these contrived points mm. um, in books I was reading, TV shows I was watching, movies I was you know, enjoying. I mean, I was just reading one book. I haven't finished it yet, so the, the author might actually uh, resolve this issue, but it's a series that's been turned into a TV series, uh, but in it, uh, the main character is being blackmailed and they're in the 22nd century, you know, they've got um, the equivalent of like iPhones, you know, these are like little glassy things you can swipe your hands over. And the person is being blackmailed by a crime syndicate and there's lots of meetings and discussions and of course there's the monologues where the bad guy confesses everything to the main character and the main character is like, oh, I'm being blackmailed, I have to go along with it. Mm. And I'm reading this. And I'm, in my mind, I'm screaming, you know, you, you've got a phone, <laughs> hit record, you've got evidence. <laughs> right. You know, and, and so that's where I see that a lot of times when people do this plotting up front, they lock themselves into a sequence 
and they don't give themselves the flexibility to realize, well, actually, that doesn't always make sense. You know, that's a non sequitur. It, it, it doesn't logically follow that someone, you know, could be blackmailed and not have any opportunity to, um, you know, gather evidence, especially in an environment where you're able to fly between planets and you've got these, you know, pocket computers that are as powerful as mainframes, you know, you put that on the court and sit there and, you know, let the, uh, let the bad guy dump on himself. Mm. So it, it, it's this interesting um, thing, but uh, an, another example I was thinking of just as we we're preparing for this call was Prometheus from the movie. Um, you know, I love aliens and Ridley C. Scott and what's been done with the franchise, but in that particular one, you know, they land on this planet that's got alien life and they walk out without spacesuits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no hazmat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then they go around and they're, they're touching black goo and they're touching snakes and it's like, and it's just to drive the plot on because somebody has to get infected. And it's like, look, there's so many better ways you could do this that aren't going to be insulting to people's intelligence. It's definitely so, a trick. It's definitely tricky. And so it sounds, you know, it's one thing that strikes me when you mentioned. So if you, let's say you write your character into a corner, right? And you do that, with this pantsing. And do you find that that slows you down? Or like, how do you think think about word counts and productivity, and and how do you approach just the whole mental game of of that? Really good question. I hate word counts. I, if someone reads one of my books for the word count, they're reading it for the wrong reason. Yeah, you know, I've got some novels that are fifty thousand words and they're absolutely brilliant. I've got others that are hundred thousand words, they're equally as good. Um, word count is a poor indicator of a story's quality. You know, if someone really wants a great word count, buy a dictionary. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I tend to write multiple books at once. So I've normally got three or four books on the go. And mm. if, I, if I find myself in a position like the zombie one where the guy's up on the, uh, the storefront and I can't get anywhere with that and I'm hitting a block, block I'll just switch to a different book. Mm. And I'll come back when there's a natural answer and pick it up again. So, you know, uh, in 2021, I've got three novels coming out in the first six months. Um, Where the Seeds May Fall, which is 100,000 words. Um, Deja Vu, which is 85,000 words. And Jury Duty. They're all first contact books, so that'll take this series from 14 up to 17 novels. Um, and, you know, uh, Wherever Seeds May Fall was written in three months. Mm. Deja Vu was written in four years. Mm. Uh, you know, it, just because the nature of the story was um, such that, you know, I'd, I'd write a bit, I'd put it down, I'd work on another project. That project would become all-consuming, I just wouldn't get back to it. And then I'd get back to it and go, God, I really love this story. And I'd, you know, write another five, six chapters, and I might hit a particular roadblock. Okay, well, I'll just put that aside, and then I'll work on something else. Yeah. Um, so that keeps the word count ticking, but... Um, you know, actual word counts uh, for a given day. I, I think it's a, you know, it's a, um, it's a mistake yeah. to would... just count, count that. Like some of my most productive writing days are just mm. reviewing what's being written, and I might mm. only add a hundred words, but I might have gone through five chapters and just, you know, refine things, cut a little bit out here, change a bit of structure there, you know, expand something, but. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think it's a real danger to be just locked in on, on word count. That's interesting. I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of conventional wisdom, but I'm very aware of conventional wisdom. And, you know, I, I know plenty of people would not advise, you know, setting aside something to work on something else, right? The danger of not finishing the the project. And clearly this works for you because you've, you've definitely put lots of material out there. Um, what year, what, when did you start writing? Do you remember? Or when, when you first published your first book? 
which would have been your third book, maybe. Yeah, I, I think I started writing in 2004, and but my first novel wasn't um, really street worthy until about 2011, and that's mm -hmm. when um, Anomaly and The Road to Hell came out. Mm -hmm. Those were my my first two novels. Right. The others have been burnt. <laughs> Has it? Has there been anything about your process that's changed in in the recent year or two that you're excited about? Um, I think it's matured. But some things I um, something I think is really important to help writers is um, just being distraction free. You know, we live in an age where it's really about fragmenting people's attention span. You know, you've got alerts going off on your phone, you've got social media happening, you've got, you know, playing games, watching TV, you know, relaxing. And all those are good in the right proportion, but they draw away from the kind of intense focus that you need as a writer in order to really craft a story. Uh, so I use an Apple Mac. Um, to write. And the reason is Apple Pages has this distraction free mode. And when you go into that, you know, there's no toolbars, there's no, there's nothing running along the bottom, there's nothing off to the sides or across the top, there's not even the title of the application. It's just a blank page. It's like sitting in front of a typewriter with a blank sheet of paper. Um, and I'll put a bit of music on. And then I'll just get in the zone and I'll be able to um, you know, really uh, lose myself in the story. And, you know, I'll, I'll come out of that and, you know, it might be three or four hours have passed and it's felt like, you know, 20 minutes. Uh, so I, I think that's a real important key. I know a lot of writers will use things like Scrivener or Microsoft Word. And if that works for them, that's great. Um, but definitely something that's helped me is having that distraction-free mode. All notifications turned off, you know, while I'm writing, that's all that matters. That, you know, there's, you know, I'm not looking at Twitter, I'm not flicking between things, you know, just able to focus. So I, I love the blank sheet of paper that you get in Apple Pages. And I know mm -hmm. if you look at writers like uh, George R. R. Martin, uh, you know, he still uses some antiquated old version of, I think it's WordStar running on an, you know, a, an ancient um, operating system from the 90s mm. uh, because it helps him to lock in and focus, and, you know, and, and it, it gives him that uh, environment where he can get in the mindset and let the creativity flow rather than being distracted and, uh, you know, being you know, um, uh, having that concentration diluted. Mm. So what keeps you writing? That's a great question. Um, I love exploring new ideas. I've got at least 20 to 25 first contact scenarios I want to develop into stories. When I first started writing, I thought it would be three or four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and I think one of the really unexpected side effects of writing has been uh, getting in contact with people, you know, expanding my horizons. I've had the joy of uh, meeting people from all around the world from every walk of life when fans have sort of reached out and said, hey, this story here, you know, I really loved it. It really helped me and, you know, and you know, I enjoyed this particular um, plot point. And, and I always try to keep my stories very science positive. I think that uh, science is underrated and not appreciated. So I try to make science um, almost a character within the stories and, and try to keep them very um, pro-science and science is the, you know, the, um, the support of the hero within the story. And yeah, it's astonishing. I've, I've, um, you know, had people reach out to me from you know, Slovakia, um, mm. you know, uh, Austria, Germany, um, you know, from all walks of life, from 
um, you know, a, a, a young lady that had twins and, um, you know, uh, said that I ruined her first good night's sleep because she started reading one of my books and couldn't put it down. <laughs> um, to, to people that work for SpaceX uh, yeah. or um, uh, I've, I've had some help from a couple of uh, people that one guy who was a flight controller for the International Space Station, um, another who is an engineer that has worked uh, for NASA and Boeing and Blue Origin now and has worked on everything from the external tank of the space shuttle to the Orion craft and now to the uh, Blue Origin New Glenn. Mm. And it's just such a privilege to um, meet these people and you know, hear their stories and find out a little bit about them. And, um, you know, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. So I find that is very inspiring. Mm. Mm. So how do you how do you balance or that relationship then with readers? You have a newsletter, I know. Like, is there is there like a protocol or ways that you you handle your readers? Yeah, I'm I'm a modestly successful author, so I'm I'm not you know a big name like Stephen King, so I don't have to worry about millions of <laughs> requests coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so if it, so if anyone reaches out with me, I'll, I'll happily chat with them and take a bit of time. And so I'll divide my day. You know, I, I tend to uh, write in the mornings and then in the afternoon is when I'll edit or sort of do social media and things like this. Um, but yeah, anyone that reaches out, I'll um, chat with. And you know, most people will reach me either through Facebook, Twitter, or via email. And, and at the end of the books, you know, I have, you know, contact details. You can get in touch here or you can subscribe to the newsletter. Um, and yeah, it's, it's always fascinating, you know, uh, and a lot of times too, I'll draw upon their expertise. Like I, I had one person contact me and they were a police officer. And so I had some questions about some uh, police procedures. So I ran it by them. I said, look, I'm you know, writing this. Would you consider this plausible? Um, and I think they enjoy that as well. And, and I'll happily credit them in the afterwards of the book mm. to say that they um, supported the writing. Because otherwise, it's an incredibly lonely process. You, it's just you sitting in front of a blank screen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Have you ever tried co writing? I did try it once and it just didn't work out. I think if you co write, you know, like someone like, uh, is it James S.A. Corey, the, the two guys that work on the Expanse right. series? Yeah. You know, they've got to have a remarkable working relationship. Um, I, I think you've got to get the right balance of personalities as well as, um, you know, interest in the story, styles. Um, uh, when I write, I, I generally have a goal in mind. You know, I, I know where a story is going. I just don't know how it's going to get there. So I know that, you know, what I'm wanting to get across in this particular story, but how I'm going to get there, that's really the question. So my latest story, um, which comes out in January, is called Where the Seeds May Fall. Mm -hmm. And the premise is that an alien spacecraft is approaching Earth. Now, one of the things about um, space is uh, any change in velocity costs you something in terms of fuel. Mm -hmm. So... When we go, uh, like when Voyager launched in the 1970s into the outer atmosphere, um, it never had enough fuel to get there. Mm. You know, they just, they couldn't build it big enough. You know, it would just take too much fuel to get off Earth. So what they did was they slingshot it past planets. And as it passed each planet, it would just pick up a little bit of speed and it would push it on to the next one. Um, kind of like pinball, if you like, on a celestial scale. And we've used this concept quite a lot. When New Horizons launched to go to Pluto, it started out in the wrong direction. They actually mm. shot it in towards the sun and slingshot it around v uh, Venus. And then it came back around Earth a second time and then shot out towards Pluto. Mm -hmm. so, so we use this concept to, um, to extend the range of our space probes way beyond what the fuel load could ever be um, possible. And so this particular story, wherever seeds may fall, it, it's sort of 
looks at that same concept and says, well, what about if the reverse was happening? What about if um, an alien spaceship was entering our solar system, but it's come from such an immense distance away mm. and, you know, and like our spacecraft, it has been meticulously designed and, um, you know, fuel to mass weight ratio is uh, so key that it has to use the gas giants to slow down. Mm. And so we're looking out with our telescopes and we actually see, you know, what we, we see what we think is a comet that's about to hit Saturn, but instead of hitting it, just grazes the side of the planet and shoots off towards Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to Jupiter, it grazes the side of the planet. And each time it's just slowing down as it approaches us. And so the story then explores the, uh, the political and social and scientific issues that would surround um, this growing awareness that this alien uh, is approaching Earth and is using essentially the opposite of what we did to slow down. You know, we used it to speed up. Um, and then I'll uh, contact people like these guys at NASA or um, uh, some scientists that have read the books and enjoyed them. And I'll, and I'll just say, you know, can you sense check my calculations here? And I've got you know, some big spreadsheet and figuring out what the amount of energy is that's being extended and all this sort of thing, just to keep it roughly plausible. None of this ever makes it into the book, but it's the background material that keeps it, you know, in the realms of plausibility rather than the realms of fantasy. And, you know, they'll come back and say, you know, yeah, this is really good. Have you considered the fact that, you know, X is going to happen and Y is going to happen? And also there's going to be secondary effects. And, and then that'll help me to sort of go, oh, okay, great. Well, I can work that into the story. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it just increases the, uh, the plausibility aspect of it so that when people read it, they, they feel like, this is something that could really happen. This isn't just, um, you know, uh, you know, something that's pure fantasy. This is, if this was to unfold, it could unfold like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, does you, so you've got this premise and you're gathering information like that hard science fiction, what would happen? It sounds like you're creating almost like this superstructure, even though you're not plotting in some sense, you're, you're getting these rails or materials that you can kind of grab from and, and use as you do, you, do you end up having more material than you use in a story or does it end up stimulating what happens in the story in some way as a character? It, the story is really what happens to these people against the backdrop of this particular event you know, rather than the story being the event itself. Mm. And so with wherever seeds may fall, it follows a number of characters. It follows a, um, uh, a lieutenant colonel and that works for NORAD. He sort of picks it all up on the, you know, using um, military radar. It follows an astrophysicist from LA um, who brings the science element to it. It follows um, a small family in Mexico that are directly affected by first contact. And, and it also follows a conspiracy theorist who's running a YouTube channel that is uh, promoting all sorts of wild speculation and fanning, fanning the flames. Um, and so in this way, you've got these four character points of focus and you're sort of seeing them as they are before things happen, and then how their lives are transformed by the events that occur in the book. And of course, the, the YouTube one is um, very relevant for our day and age because we have so much, um, you know, people using social media to manipulate others and to spread chaos and confusion. It can be trolling, it can be um, to mislead because of ideological reasons. And so that is something that is you know, happening to us as a society right now. And it's something that would happen should an event like this book ever occur. You're going to have these people that are 
you know, reacting out of fear and of spreading misinformation and things like this. And, and so you sort of look, you know, well, what's that person's life like outside of YouTube? What's that person's life going to be like, um, you know, when they're confronted with these things? And it's the kind of tension that we have seen with US election, that we've seen with Brexit, that we've seen with uh, the pandemic, where reality is just unfolding like a snowball and around it, there's all these different narratives. And so, you know, capturing that um, it is, is quite interesting because it, it's almost like um, role playing to see, well, you know, how would something like this unfold in real life and what solutions could, could present themselves? Yeah. All right. There was a blip in space time and we we're talking about character and premise. Yeah, so when it comes to the novel Wherever Seas May Fall, it was inspired by a um, conversation that happened online when uh, a couple of years ago when a, an extrasolar object passed through our solar system called Omau Mau. Um, and at the time, uh, one of the leading astrophysicists in the US, Dr. Katie Mack, was chatting in Twitter with a number of scientists around the world. and. And it's one of the things I love about Twitter, you know, for all its faults and for all the um, uh, vitriol and stuff that can arise on it, there's also a, an astonishing opportunity to, you know, connect with scientists and doctors and researchers around the world and, mm. uh, and get to, you know, hear their thoughts on various things. So as Omamao is passing through the solar system, the telescopes of the world are looking at it and spectroscopy is trying to analyze what it's composed of. And of course, um, immediately people jump to the conclusion, it's aliens, you know, it's an alien spacecraft walking by. And they would be the first ones to admit if it was aliens. And one of the points they made was, you know, whenever you see these movies and, you know, some researcher is sitting in some backwater looking at it, screen and all of a sudden the army fly in and shut everything down because they're communicating with extraterrestrials. Mm. And she made the point that, you know, that could never happen because one of the first things that needs to happen when any discovery happens is to verify it. You have to talk to somebody else. You know, if you've got your telescope looking up at some object, you need to make sure that's not a satellite or, mm -hmm. or some other military sort of things. And, and you need to talk to people on the other side of the world um, to actually determine that, yes, that is an object that is, you know, millions of miles away or several light years away. Um, and, and because, the, you know, the scientific process needs that level of input. Um, and so, you know, if there was evidence for something like a Mau Mau being an alien um, spacecraft or an alien device, it, it would come out really quickly because the scientists need to talk about it. They need to discuss the options and mm. they're going to need, you know, really solid evidence that that is the case, not just speculation. And so seeing that discussion is what inspired this particular book. Cause it was like, okay, well, if that did happen, how could it play out? And so I contacted um, Dr. Mack and said, look, you know, I've used this as a basis of the story and she was very gracious. And, and, um, and I said, you know, I, I gave her an advanced copy and so I hope you enjoy it. Mm. Um, and added a little bit in the afterward about that discussion inspiring the story. And so in the book, Where the Seeds May Fall, um, you know, there's a section where there is, look, a, a Twitter chat that's entirely theoretical, you know, or fictional, I should say. Um, but it unfolds, you know, the way that scientists would um, chat if they were, having their suspicions aroused, if they were slowly, slowly seeing the evidence accumulate and it become more and more plausible and more and more possible that, hey, this isn't actually a comet. This really is the real deal. This is um, first contact that's unfolding. Mm. So, yeah, the story had that basis. And um, because it had a character that was very similar to Dr. Mack, I, I um, contacted her and said, look, you know, um, I'm happy to credit you in the afterward that, you know, your discussion inspired the story. Um, but it's not really built, you know, around her. I don't know her personally and I don't know, you know, what she's like. You know, my character is entirely fictitious, but it was 
based on that initial discussion that happened about Omao mm. and how that un- discussion could have unfolded if it really was an alien spacecraft. Yeah. I notice, I've, I've read a couple of your works, and I notice you have uh, a wide, I want to say, tonal range from what I've observed to like the mood or the feeling of a story. And maybe, maybe what I'm observing is that that's just set around what, whoever the character is and the story is. Are you conscious of, of that as you are putting out works? Yes. I hate repetitive work. Like, um, uh, I'm not one to write the same story a dozen times, you know, and, just call it a series. I, I want to challenge. And so I'll write books that are entirely different one after the other, and, and I'll use different techniques. You know, sometimes they'll be first person, present tense, and they'll be almost claustrophobic. Um, mm. I released a story this year called But the Stars, and it's from the perspective of a doctor on a spacecraft that's been taken over by aliens that can you know, manipulate the senses and cause essentially, you know, paranoid delusions. Um, And so that was really drawn and tight. You never got any, uh, you know, vantage point beyond that of the doctor trying to figure out what's real. Mm. And and then you go to something like Where the Seeds May Fall, and it's written in the third person. Um, And it's written from the point of view of five or six different characters. So all of a sudden you've got this real wide field of view. And for me, that's what attracts me to writing is the challenge, you know, um, of, you know, uh, tackling these stories in different ways that suit that story. So, uh, but the stars couldn't have been written any other way than it was. And wherever seeds may fall, you know, has an entirely different tone and feel and mood about it, the mood and the emotion um, and how to best convey that. And, and, and it can be challenging because you've, You've got this backdrop of the story, you know, uh, the setting on the stage, so to speak, um, but then picking the right person to be the, the point from which that story is viewed, mm. um, the person that's looking out at the events as they unfold and, and then how they journey through that particular story. Like I say, that, you know, to me, the plot is the character in motion against the backdrop of the setting, um, you know, rather than the, the plot being, you know, something that's meticulously you know, drawn out on a board and has little lines between boxes and things like this. It's, so it's, it's about people living through things. Mm. I think that's what we're interested in. We're interested in people, ultimately. You know, we, we, we're a very social um, species. We, we, we thrive on interactions with each other and um, understanding those interactions, understanding cause and intent and uh, things like this. So it's, it's interesting to explore them in different ways. Yeah. And, you know, pivoting slightly, there's the impact of writing with that kind of range on your author brand, right? Do you feel that because you've been taking this approach from the beginning that it, you know, it attracts a different reader? You've obviously attracted and maintained a readership as you bounce around between, you know, oh, oh, I, I lost you. I lost you from pivoting slightly. Yeah. Well, okay, great. So the many authors are, you know, I've heard in direct conversations, you know, might not take the chance of writing such different work in terms of tone and, and mood and all those things, because, Sometimes those can be the author brand, and there's a concern that you know, the readership that you've gotten writing in one style might not be interested in these other stories or react well to them. Um, are those honestly, things you are those things that you thought about at some point, or? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I think it's hurt my career. Mm. Just to be quite frank, so I've written um, a story in the style of Kurt Vonnegut which can be found in the anthology Hello World. It's called Children's Crusade. Mm. And I really studied Kurt Vonnegut's writing style, his tone, his voice, his mood, his 
cadence and his rhythm. And I really sought to emulate that. Um, now, fans of Kurt Vonnegut would love it. Uh, mm. Fans of mine read it and go, well, this is really off the wall. Well, it's because Kurt Vonnegut was off the wall. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And that's okay, as long as you're okay with that, right? And it sounds yeah. like you, you're very intentional about that. You're writing for a reason, and that may not be the prime reason. It's one of the reasons why I developed the first content series was so that readers knew what they were in for. Mm. You know, so if they go to books outside of that series, you know, they're going to get vampires, they're going to get zombies, they're going to get Sherlock Holmes, they're going to get um, Mr. Fluffy Bunny, which is about a, um, a, a, a young girl that's orphaned in Mexico. <laughs> it's no science fiction in it at all. It's great very story. dark. <laughs> yeah, 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 great story, but but very, very different. So first contact was a way of saying, okay, you know, if you're just after first contact, we'll look at these ones. You know, if you, yeah. if you want something that's off the wall, have a look over here. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, you know, I, I write what I enjoy and it, it doesn't always translate. Um, I do consider my books sort of divided into two categories and that is um, art house and crowd pleasers. Mm. So, Novels like Ezekiel, which has done really well. It's only been out a year and it's already got 900 reviews for a um, rating of 4.5 stars on Amazon. Uh, it's a crowd pleaser. It's deliberately designed like that. Mm. Um, uh, but the stars is art house. You know, it, it's a great story. I love it, but it's, you know, it's not, it, it's something that the connoisseurs are going to love rather than something where, you know, people can just pick it up and, um, read it without too much thought and stuff like that. Whereas Three Ezekiel is a, a first contact story that happens in the jungle and involves not only humans, but primates like um, gorillas and, yeah. and looks again at that, you know, how plausible contact could occur. And, and it has been a real crowd pleaser. So one I swear, of your, One of your two most rated works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and so so I, I sort of bounce between those books um, with the three that are coming out this, uh, you know, in the next six months. Uh, Wherever Seeds May Fall is definitely a crowd pleaser. Um, Deja Vu is art house. <laughs> it's so, you know, so you know this ahead of time at some yeah, point. Yeah. Do you so know I, that from the very premise at the point of having a premise or as you're writing? Yeah, from the, from the point of premise. And, and then jury duty, again, is sort of crowd-pleasing material. You know, I know it's going to have a broad appeal. Um, and so I sort of accept, okay, well, Deja Vu is not going to do as good as 3 Ezekiel or Wherever Seeds May Fall or Anomaly, you know, because it's, it, it's more classic science fiction. It's more, um, you know, it's a, it echoes back to the golden age of science fiction in terms of its storytelling and its mm. depth and things like this and and so it's much more of a limited audience yeah yeah so, and does that change how you approach your marketing for certain books or do you kind of take things through one one process regardless yeah i i just use one process but um yeah and it's interesting to see how the uh, you know readers respond you know, really uh, marketing is incredibly hard. Uh, it, you know, it's like whispering at a rock concert, yeah. uh, <laughs> try, trying to get the word out on stories. Um, and I think marketing um, gives a book a good shove, that gives it a good push, but then it's really up to the readers. Um, you know, Three Ezekiel has done so well, not because of any marketing efforts on my part. I, you know, I, ga I gave it everything I could at the launch. But then, you know, readers got behind it. You know, they loved it. They fell in love with the story. They enjoyed the characters. They found the setting fascinating, you know, and, and so they told other people and, and that sort of natural organic growth is what has kept the book um, going. Right. So that kind of bears itself out in the range of results. And yeah. Oh, I had a question on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. And that went off. Actually, okay, I know what I was going to ask. So one of the things that's implicit to our conversation that we haven't just out and said is that you've been independently publishing these, right, these works so far. 
Yes, yeah, so I've got two books that are traditionally published. Okay. Um, that's Retrograde and Reentry. Um, but I struggle to get any traction with traditional publishers. Um, Where the Seeds May Fall was actually finished about a month and a half, two months ago. And I tried to, pub- I tried to place it with um, Zeno Agency. I tried to get Tor interested in it. I tried to get uh, my previous publisher interested in it. Unfortunately, the previous publisher went out of business due to the pandemic. So mm. that, that kind of fell flat. And wherever the season before, I think it's going to be a real crowd pleaser. I think it's really going to do well because it, I, I know the ingredients that are in there and I know how they've sort of played out in other books. Yeah. Um, but I just can't get any response from the traditional publishers. There's a, um, a book reviewer in California, uh, Mal Warwick, and he's you know, been a member of the Science Fiction Writers Association of America for you know, 30, 40 years. He's you know, headed up all sorts of um, you know, different uh, critic societies and things like this. And he's read several of my works and, he, and he's, he's said to me, he said it in reviews as well as in emails to me, he goes, you know, why haven't you been snapped up by Tor? And I'm like, mm. <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I think part of the problem is there's so much competition, there's so much noise, there's so much uh, um, going on that it's very hard for them to, you know, pick and choose between and they, they, just, they just get... You know, it's like drinking from a fire hose for them trying to figure out mm. what they want. I, I would love to do more with um, traditional publishers. I, I'd love to push all the crown pleasers through traditional publishers and mm. things. So why uh, why is that? What what are you what what are you hoping to get out of that exchange? Because it is an exchange, um, right? Yeah, I I think that there's a market there that I just do not reach. You know, mm. not having a book on a shelf is. Um, you know, there, there are readers that just will never see my works. Um, I come from a background where, you know, as a teen, I would love going into used bookstores and searching through and finding books. You know, my, uh, I've got a copy of um, Contact by Carl Sagan that I found in a, you know, dusty corner of a, a secondhand bookstore and snapped up as soon as I saw it. You know, and it saddens me that no my books will end up there. Mm. Uh, you know, it's it, the the ebook revolution is a two edged sword. And on one hand, it means that you can make books available, you know, at the price of a cup of coffee. E- ebooks aren't just aren't for everyone. There's a lot of people that love to get a book in their hands, and I'm one of them. Yeah. I am. I'm probably ten times more likely to finish a book if I've, I've physically got a copy than if I've got it in an uh, electronic format. Mm. Is that because you? went through more of a process that was kind of a comfort process to get that book? Yeah, I, I guess. Um, it just, maybe it's the um, ability to immerse myself more in it, you know, to block out distractions, to really mm. just, you know, and, and it's something that, you know, you, you, you physically got, you can go back to, whereas, um, you know, for me, ebooks. It, it just doesn't have the same um, depth. So mm. it, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I don't know if other people feel the same way or not. It'd be interesting to find out. But yeah. but yeah. So I'd love to see some of these books actually on bookshelves and reaching a broader audience than um, than you know just the 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 cheap ebook yeah. market. Well, I, I know. I know. At the moment. I know that in the broader audience, right? Like there's it's it's more than just there's gatekeepers who are giving us the books and telling us what's good to read but that there's also some sort of broader community engagement to it right like there's like some comfort in knowing that hey we're all checking out and reading and conversing about the same pool of books um yeah yeah uh and I, I think books, whether it's an ebook or a, a paperback, you know, there's real value in them in terms of social constructs. You know, ultimately they're fictional. They're, they're, um, you know, they're not real, <laughs> mm. but they have real value. And that's one of the paradoxical things about them that, 
you know, they really do communicate to people. Um, they help reinforce notions of empathy, um, build understanding, um, you know, and, you know, uh, if, you, if you think about, you know, why we read and, and why we, um, you know, enjoy whether it's watching TV or movies and things like this, you know, it's not just escapism, I don't think. You know, there's an element of companionship. You know, you're on the journey with the protagonist. Mm -hmm. I often remind myself that the protagonist of my books is my reader. You know, mm. they're living through the eyes of that particular person. Mm. Um, and it's because, you know, we, we're intelligent. We seek outlets for that intelligence. We want that intelligence to be engaged. And, and books are a way of doing that. Ultimately, we each live one life. You know, we each only have one pair of eyes with which we view the world around us. And books are an opportunity to actually see life from a different perspective, to, to consider things from scenarios that we'll never live through, you know, yeah. walking on Mars or, you know, traveling on a spaceship or meeting extraterrestrials. And so it's exercising that creativity, that intelligence, that emotion. Um, and it means that, you know, books are far more important and far more valuable than, you know, the, the dollar rating on the cover. Mm. Mm. yeah well, it's a very thoughtful answer and you sound like you're very thoughtful about your process in general um for for people who want to know more about you peter how can they do that all of my books are available on amazon um you know my surname cordron is c-a-w-d-r-o-n rather than the classic you know which is cordron although the name is related to that it um mm. it um it's related to the witch's cauldron as described in Shakespeare. I once found out, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, I'm active on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I have a website called Thinking Sci-Fi where I talk about uh, books and current science and, and my thoughts on some of these things. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, if you're into science fiction and you want something that's thought-provoking, as well as um, really character-based, you know, uh, character-centric. Um, yeah, it's worth picking up some of the books. I do have a free book that is out there as a bit of a teaser, something to interest readers if they want to pick up something that's, um, you know, out of curiosity. It's called Trixie and Me. Okay. Uh, and, um, that's out there as well. So. Great. Well, Peter, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Ethan, thank you for inviting me. It's been a fun conversation and um, yeah, keep up the great work. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of The Fearless Storyteller. As a reminder, any and all links can be found in the show notes. And if you're enjoying this podcast, will you please consider leaving a review? By doing so, you'll be helping new listeners discover The Fearless Storyteller podcast.